This is a short video about section 3.2 and 3.21, 3.2.1 in Stein's number theory book. And it's about the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Now, in the previous video, um, we looked at a key exchange where you have a prime, so there's Nikita and there's Michael, and they want to send a message back and forth to each other. So their idea was they'd pick a prime P and some number G that's less than that prime. And both of these things are things that everybody knows. In other words, anybody that's trying to eavesdrop on their conversation has, also has uh, access to that knowledge. But Nikita picks a secret number that only she knows, 31. And Michael picks a secret number that only he knows, 95. Now what Nikita will do, she'll tell Michael what n times g is, and that's public, so everybody knows what n times g is. And similarly, Mike will tell Nikita what m times g is, and that's public as well. So that's information that, again, any eavesdropper has access to as well. Now what Nikita and Michael can do is they can figure out what their shared secret key is, which should be theoretically a key that only the two of them can compute. Now what's wrong with this example here is that um, it's not too hard to figure out what n is. In other words, Nikita's secret key wouldn't be very secret here. Given g, and given that n times g is equal to 58, it's not too hard to have a computer figure out that that other factor, uh, n, it's not too hard to have a computer find what it is. And similarly, uh, with Michael's key, it's not too hard to figure out what, uh, if m times g is 87, and you know g, it's not too hard to figure out what m is. So that's why that system is bad. But what if we change it to the following? And this is, again, the idea of Diffie-Hellman. So here's what they're going to do instead. Here's a better idea for Michael and Nikita, if they still want to send a message back and forth to each other. So they're both going to pick a very big number, P, that's prime, or that's likely prime anyway. And they'll pick another G that's between 1 and P. Nikita is going to secretly pick an N, and Michael is going to secretly choose an M. And again, only Nikita knows this, and only Michael knows M. Now what Nikita's going to do, and here's the big difference, instead of n times g, like in the previous example, she's going to compute g to the nth power and reduce that mod p. And this is the number that she will send over to Michael. So she tells Michael g to the n. Now theoretically, anybody listening also knows g to the n. But at this point, what we can also see is if only Nikita knows n, and if g to the n is some number here, mod p, what we'll see and what this section is really about is the idea that figuring out what this exponent is is an incredibly hard problem, even for a computer to do. And that's the foundation of the security for a crypto system. Similarly, Michael is going to send Nikita g to his secret key, g to the nth power. And again, this idea of even if you know g and you know p, it's really, really hard to figure out what that exponent is. And again, we'll see as we go forward. So that together then, the secret key that only Michael and Nikita have access to would be g to the n times n power. So think about this, right? I'll look here. Michael is going to tell Nikita g to the m. She's just going to take that and raise it to the nth power. And now she has a key. And Michael will have the same one because Nikita sends him g to the nth. He's just going to take that and raise that to his key. And he also recovers that. So again, theoretically, g to the n times n power is a number that only Nikita and Michael know. So that, again, is why we'll call it their shared secret key. And in this example here, they just kind of do the same things with the same n, n m, p's, and g's before. Um, so when we take um, 5 to the 31st power and reduce it mod 97, you get 7. And so what Nikita is going to do again, Nikita is going to send 7 to Michael. He's going to take that, and he's going to raise it to the 95th, and he should get 14. That's the secret key. Similarly, um, um, Michael is going to send Nikita 39 mod p. She's going to take that and raise it to her key 31, and she should get 14 also. So again, they both have the secret key, the shared secret key of 14. So this idea, this is the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, and it's built around what's called the discrete log problem. So Nikita and Michael, they communicate with each other by trying to encrypt everything with some kind of a secret key here. And again, in order to understand the conversation, an eavesdropper, they have to know what the shared secret key is. He needs to know what S is. So like in the above example here, an eavesdropper would need to know 14. But 14 is relatively secure. It would be hard for anyone else besides Nikita and Michael to come up with the number 14. And again, assuming that P was a much larger number. Maybe for P equals 97, it's not too hard to figure out that it's 14. But when these are incredibly, incredibly large numbers that are 100 digits along, then it's very hard to recover what 14 is. 
Anyway though, but again, everybody knows P, everybody knows G, everybody knows G to the N, and everybody knows G to the M. So this idea again is, if I know G and I know P, and I know G to the N, can I recover N? And that's a very hard problem to do. So if I scroll down a little bit here, the discrete log problem, in other words, uh, how do we compute log base B of A? where A and B both come from some finite group, like say C mod PZ star, um, this idea of how do you find this exponent is called the discrete logarithm problem. So if you've got a finite group G, and typically we will play with G mod, C mod PZ star, given an element B and G, and if you're given a power A of B, so A is like B to the N, could you recover what N is? Could you figure out what N is? And then now what we're saying to do is, yeah, you take, you know, log of both sides, right? And then you get your n. But the point is, it's very, very hard to do whenever your a's and your b's come from a finite group like this. The logarithm, where your elements are a finite group, that logarithm is very weird. And we're about to look at a picture of how weird it is. And what you also might think is that if you just try to, well, I'll just start computing powers of b until I get the a there, and whatever power works is n. Again, the idea is we're choosing these numbers very, very large so that these computations become incredibly uh, inefficient. So when p is super large, when the prime modulus is large, when we compute this discrete log, it becomes impractical because you're increasing the number of digits of the modulus and that makes the computation take a lot longer. But a good picture too about what's some of the weirdness that's going on. Like, you know, I, I can take logarithms and that gets exponents down. Well, we're used to taking playing with the continuous logarithm, which is this one on the left here. So that's again for all real num for, for you know real numbers from zero to infinity and again the continuous logarithm like we know and love. But over here is the discrete log mod 53. So these are when I just plug in elements of uh, z mod 53 star. And you see what's the point? This is pretty well behaved, right? Like there's a pattern to it, and you can probably kind of guess what some values are. Whereas this one is just all over the damn place. And what you can imagine is that's just when it's 53. Imagine when that is a gigantic number, the mess that this would be. It's kind of a picture of randomness in a way. Also too, if you're curious about how in Sage to make these plots, like these plots are from Sage, um, here actually is the code that would draw those plots.